down um, page 14, dealing with evangelists. Now, guys, the truth is we should all be evangelists. Amen? Amen. We should all be able to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. We should all be able to know how to give our testimony in a heartbeat. Right? So the spirit of evangelism every church should have, we should all be sharing. But an evangelist is somebody that God specifically equips to raise up more evangelists. He operates as a five-fold Ephesians 4 gift. And his job in the body of Christ is to raise up more evangelism, not to do all the evangelism himself. Okay? So there's a guy in my church, his name is Bart. His wife's name is Pam. And um, Pam's family owns a company called Regal Boats in Central Florida. And they make small yachts, and they ship them all over the world. And their company is probably 75 years old. They employ eight, 900 people. So Pam's parents are extremely wealthy. Pam married a guy named Bart. Bart's an evangelist. They moved to Guatemala, out into an area of the mountains that you can hardly get to. And they lived in this little place they built with no electricity, no running water, and they planted 22 churches. And I said to Pam one day, Pam's father passed away, her parents died, and they left her their house. Well, their house was worth $750,000. It's on a lake in central Florida and some of those prime property that there is. She could be living the, the life of a queen, and she chose to give all that up to go to Guatemala. And so in Guatemala now, we have 22 churches, and we have a Bible school there that we built. We built. When we say we reached a village, it means the whole village was lost. There was no gospel witness. The village got saved. I dealt with the witch doctor. <laughs> and um, we built a church, and we built a pastor's house, and we put a pastor and a family in that village. And we did that 22 times in Guatemala. And so... Um, Pam's like my hero, Bart and Pam. So now that they've reached the area of Guatemala, they feel like they're supposed to reach. Now they're in India. And they've taken some of the wealth from Regal because Regal takes a tithe from the boat company and puts it in missions. And they've created um, in India and in China, they're using it, a little chip that you can plug into your phone that has worship on it and the gospel on it. And they bought millions of them. And they're all over India now. They're all over China now. And we're able to, you know, sneak into China with these little computer chips. They just plug them in their phone. We just give them out by thousands. I can't tell you how many people are getting saved because Bart and Pam had an idea. And so that's what an evangelist does. They're after, they're after countries, not just people. Okay. And so I love doing the work of an evangelist. Okay, And so people are always after the pastor to go do all the work of the evangelism. No, he's supposed to teach you how to do it. Okay? So I'm going to go a little faster through these because I want to make sure that I try to cover them. Page 16, who, has the, who here has the gift of hospitality? Yay! You love having people in your home. You love cleaning your house. <laughs> <laughs> you love having people in. You just enjoy it. Those are the people that ought to be having small groups in their houses. Not, not the house where the wife likes to clean once a month. That house has an unclean spirit. <laughs> now, in my household, my wife on any given day is going to be studying something and saving somebody's life with what she gets. I remember cleaning the house once in 1987. So. I love to clean. I love to clean. She's like, honey, I'm so glad that's your gift. It's not supposed to be just my gift. <gasps> but I, we love having people in our house. The house we bought has a really big room in it that we can put 30 people in it. That's why we bought the house. Okay, And so hospitality is an awesome gift in the body of Christ. The gift of faith. The, you got to put a uh, on there. The, get the faith. Uh. 
<laughs> okay. So the gift of faith. To discern with extraordinary confidence the will and purpose of God in his work. So operating in the gift of faith. Stepping out to see God do supernatural things. And um, seeing supernatural healings. Some of you have a gift of faith. It's just in you. You can't help it. When you hear about a whatever situation, something you goes, God could do that. Amen. Mm -hmm. Who has that? That's awesome. That is so cool. Amen. So you ought to be praying for the sick. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, in our church, if somebody says they're sick, 10 people surround them, they pray for them. Okay, so the gift of faith is is just a, it's tremendous. It's just a tremendous thing, you know. I look, I look back on my life, and I, there are times that the Spirit of God just came and just gave me faith for something. We were in we were in Spain, and um, we we're doing a prophetic conference in a Muslim neighborhood. <laughs> so we advertised it. We didn't know if people would come. One hundred twenty five hundred people. 50 people showed up that night. All the ladies came in with all the burqa stuff and all that crazy stuff. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering I wonder how this is going to go, you know? I thought at the time that we did, it was a great idea, you know, until they showed up. And then a guy broke in, AK-47, back door, came screaming in. And he was so upset that we were going to share our faith, right? And I honestly thought we were going to die. And one of the guys with me looked at the guy and he just spoke it. He got a word of knowledge. He pointed at the man and says, the Lord says when you were four years old that you were molested by your uncle and that's why you're so full of rage. The man dropped his gun and fell on his face. It's totally true. So I go down there and, and the guy gets saved. And we took the gun. <laughs> and so now... I can't to describe to you what happened. I'm not allowed to speak to the Muslim women, but there's about 30 of them. So I'm walking around them. First Corinthians says, the God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving that they can't see. And I'm asking God to remove their blinders. And they stopped ripping these things off. These 30 ladies got saved. I mean, they got saved. And I'm like, Lord, what are they going to do in their culture and going back to their culture and their families? And they could be killed. And I'm kind of freaking out. And I'm standing on the, like the first step of the stage. They're all just right here. And the Lord said, they need the power of God. And without thinking, I stepped back. I went, Whew. the entire group came off the ground, flew in the wall, got filled with the Holy Spirit and started speaking in tongues. And revival started there. There's a church there now. And that stuff happened because of faith. God, where does faith come from? Hearing a word Hearing the scripture, right? God spoke to us and said to do that, so that means that God's going to show up and do it. Amen. Right? We had a, the Russian mafia is there like you can't imagine. I mean, it's a crazy place in southern Spain. So one day, we actually had a day off, and so we go down the beach, and I'm telling you the truth, I really don't see that well. And so my guy that's with me, his name's Ray. He's incredibly prophetic. We get out of the beach, we're going to actually see the beach, Mediterranean. It's beautiful. Ray grabs me, he said, Joe, stop. I said, what's the matter? He said, it's a topless beach. I said, I said, are you serious? He said, yes. I said, no problem. Whipped off my shirt. <laughs> oh, we laughed for a long time. <laughs> so Abraham, you know, and hope against hope, he believed. He believed. Page 20, the gift of leadership, a governmental gift. Let me, let me tell you, uh, we, it's called leadership here. In other versions, it's called the gift of administration. All right? The gift of, I have this gift, so this is how it works. I've had it since I was a kid. It's part of who I am. I can't help it. If I walk into a place and it's disorganized, if somebody doesn't do it, I'm going to organize it. Okay? And so, but it's not somebody, the gift of administration, it's not somebody who sits at a desk with paper clips and filing systems. It's somebody that can walk into any situation and see disorder and bring order. Amen. So I do a lot of personal ministry and counseling. So if somebody comes to me that's really messed up, right? I have a 30-page questionnaire they go through. 
and I sort through their life, and I can find the scheme and the plan of the enemy and where it started, how it works, how it got there, and how it can get defeated. But it's because of the gift of administration, I can sort all that information and it doesn't overwhelm me. Right? So somebody with the gift of administration, scripturally speaking, is somebody that can walk into a business that's out of order and fix it. I can walk into churches that are out of order and fix them. There's no hope for your pastor because he can't find his keys. <laughs> Thank God his wife can administrate. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> extend your hand toward his wife. Just extend your hand. Okay. <laughs> we all have different gifts, right? We have different gifts. Okay. Okay. Leadership. Administrations. Okay. Let's go on to miracles. The gift of miracles. Page 22. It pleases God to perform powerful acts that are perceived by others to have altered the ordinary course of nature. The gift of miracles. And so I'd like to tell you that I've seen a lot of miracles. I've seen some. I see most of them overseas. People always ask me, why does God do all this stuff overseas? Because they're hungry. And because they're desperate. And because they don't have hospitals. In Guatemala, we've seen three children that were dead come back. And those people operate on a level of faith and miracles that I'd, I'd like to have. Okay? So, I was in Israel, and I'd been praying for months. The church I went to was a real New Testament church. They have worship like we have worship, and the Spirit of God's really moving there. And the Lord told me that the Spirit of God was going to fall like Acts 2 in Israel someday. So I was over there ministering, and it was a Saturday night, and this really old man, I mean, really old man, older than you. <laughs> he, comes, he comes forward, and when he turned his hands over to receive prayer, this serial number from Auschwitz was on his wrist. And he had watched his wife and children walk into a death chamber. Okay. And he went to synagogue that morning, and he decided they kept him alive because he's a strong guy and he was able to do the labor at the camp, and he, he survived Auschwitz. He made it back to Israel. And so him making it back to Israel was a miracle because the Nazis tried to kill all those people before they left those camps. So anyway, he comes forward and... That morning, he went to his normal temple, and he decided, you know, if God's alive, he's not in the temple. So for the first time in his life, he went to a church other than a Jewish synagogue. He said, God, if you're not here, you know, he's in his late 80s. If you're not here, then I want to kill myself because you don't exist. Now, I don't know any of that. So he comes forward. I see the Auschwitz thing. I start to pray for him. And the Lord told me he had congestive heart failure, and I put my hand on his heart. And my hand really started getting, when my hands feel oily, I know God wants me to pray for somebody. I, sometimes I can't feel my fingers. And when I put my hand on him, I began to feel the fire of God on, on his chest. And he began, he, he literally almost screamed. He said, what's going on? What's going on? And he's, his chest is on fire. And God healed his heart. The ushers had to help carry him up the steps to get him in the building. He was out there running up down the steps, laughing and rejoicing. He said, God's alive. God's alive. God's alive. So at midnight, I got to hear his whole story. That was his story. So God did a miracle for him, showing him he's real and alive before he perished. You know, the guy died like six weeks later. But the guy went to heaven. So God doing miracles are awesome. Guess who God uses to do miracles? Ordinary people. Page 24, healing. There are people who have gifts of healing. They just do. Um, so in my church in Orlando, there's a lawyer. His name's Tony. And Tony had a law firm. And uh, he had a lot of other lawyers and paralegals and all kinds of stuff. And Tony's a really godly man. And um, he said, Pastor Joe, there's something wrong in my office. 
I said, what do you mean? He said, there's a spirit, there's something wrong. We went down there in the middle of the night when all the, everybody was gone, praying to the offices. And I walked into one of his partner's offices and every time I'd step into the office, the whole room would spin around. I'd step back out and it would stop. So the Lord was saying to Tony, you need to check out to see what's going on with this partner. Well, this partner had made a huge mistake and the firm was about to get sued for millions upon millions of dollars. So by that word of knowledge, Tony's able to fix it, straighten it all out. Anyway, two weeks later, Tony got a prophetic word from a man that never met him to sell his law firm and go do missions full time. So he did. Tony is now in Ecuador, Peru, all those nations nonstop. He has a gift of healing that you just can't. I'm going to tell you, 80% of the people he prays for get healed. He just has a gift of healing. So one night, Tony is going to a church, supposed to be an interpreter there, church 600, no interpreter. Nobody spoke English. Tony's like, what do I do? The Lord said, just stand up. Tony walked up there, started speaking in perfect Spanish. He's never stopped. Mm. Mm. He can write Spanish. He couldn't speak a word of Spanish before that. Gift of tongues. Mm -hmm. So tongues operates three levels. There's the prayer language tongue, builds it up, builds it up in the Holy Spirit. There's a tongue that's a message to the church that has to be interpreted. And there's literally the gift of tongues that's another language. Mm -hmm. I was in Guatemala and a little pastor about this tall. He only he didn't speak Spanish, spoke Pocanchia mountain dialect. An American missionary Baptist guy shows up and we're doing a deliverance <laughs> conference. I said, his name is Paul. I said, Paul, I don't know if you want to stick around for this. This isn't really Baptist. -y. And there was a lot of deliverance going on. And so one evening, Paul stuck around. This little, little guy, I like going there because I'm tall. And he grabbed Paul. He jumped up on a picnic table and grabbed Paul. He shouts in perfect English. He thinks he's speaking in tongues. The Lord God says, you must get filled with the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues now. And he shouts it twice in perfect English. He doesn't even speak Spanish. And we're all like, Paul, the Holy Ghost falls on me, gets knocked across the room. Paul's out for an hour and a half, gets up speaking in tongues, can't stop speaking in tongues for about an hour. He comes over to me, he's like, he's got tears in his eyes, he's like, I can't go back to my Baptist church. <laughs> so what was that? A gift of faith in the little guy, a gift of tongues, right? A miracle, the power of God, right? It's fun. Say it with me, fun. It's not religious. It's also scary. <laughs> the gift of tongues. We just covered tongues. Do you have any questions about tongues? If so, I'll talk to you later in tongues. <laughs> Obviously, the interpretation of tongues. This happened to me two weeks. I was visiting a church. A lady had a message in tongues, and I just simply interpreted it. Voluntary poverty. Anybody have that gift? Nobody seems to want that gift. Willing to give up all that they have for the sake of the gospel. Yeah, there are people that do that, you know. There's the sweetest couple in Guatemala City. They were really fairly wealthy in the States. They sold their house. They live in a little shack. They've been there 40 years. I don't know how they live. And they just love it. They think they're in heaven. Yeah, Guatemala's not in heaven to me, okay. The gift of celibacy. Who wants that gift? I've never been asked that in 50 years. <laughs> Do we have any single people back there? Any, any of the young people? You have it? Stand up, will you? I think you're a little older. Stand up. Yeah. Are you guys all single? Stand up, you chicken. <laughs> Now, ladies, the ladies in the back, the others can sit down. Ladies in the back, just the ladies. Yeah, ladies, stay. He's the pastor's son. So the question is, this is a gift. I'm a prophet. Do you want to know who your husbands will be? Who wants to know? It's a guy. It's a guy. 
<laughs> you can sit down. <laughs> Is that a gift or what? <laughs> am, am I accurate? I hope so. Yeah. We, <laughs> okay. I have a friend that stayed single his entire life because the places God, God, God called him to go, he could not have taken a wife and family. And he was good with that. Okay? I did not have that gift. I was dating my wife, it'd take four hours to say goodnight. <laughs> Some of you remember stuff like that. Are you that old out there? Come on, y'all. Okay. Intercession. I love intercessors. God, they just love to pray, and they know that prayer is the only thing that's going to really affect people. Here's the problem with intercessors. Most of them are discerning and are prophetic. And they think that when they hear something from God and they take it to the pastor, he should do what they tell him. Intercessors destroy churches. Because they don't know how to take what they get and give it to the authority and release it. Because they're trying to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Your goal is to pray and to hear from God. And if God gives you things that are affecting the church, you give it to the pastor and you let go of it. Mm -hmm. But I heard from the Lord. That's nice. Good. Let go of it. Okay? He's the primary prophet in this church, even if that's not his gift. All right? So having intercessors is awesome. There is a book. It's, the name of the book is Intercessors. It's written by a man named Reese Howells. R-E-E-C-E-H-O-W-E-L-L-S. Reese Howells. And it was written around World War II. And General MacArthur in England, in London, and Churchill, they had a whole group of intercessors that had a place in the War Council building. And they wouldn't make any major moves unless God confirmed it through the intercessors. So when D-Day happened, the weather guy said, you know what? It's stormy. The seas are too rough. You know, we're talking about sending thousands of people and ships and and the intercessors came to Eisenhower. Was it Eisenhower in, in England? I don't remember. Was it? Anyway, they came to him. They said, General, the Lord says you can. It's good. It's, you should launch today. And they went to Normandy. And it was stormy the entire way across the channel. And they got to Normandy and the weather cleared two miles off the beach. And they were able to be successful because of that. The Germans didn't see them come until they were two miles away because the intercessors spoke. And so the whole book is about how God uses intercessors in history to change history. It's one of the most exciting books I think I've ever read. I read it once a year because it stirs my faith to pray. Uh, next gift, page 31, exorcism. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've kind of covered that. We've talked about it some. If you want to know what I really think about it, get my book on it. Um, we got to tell at least one good demon story, right? Yeah. So I had a dream. I have prophetic dreams. I always keep a yellow tablet by my bed. And I woke up. I mean, in this dream, there was a girl named Stephanie. And um, she was like a normal 20-year-old girl. Then another part of the dream, she'd become a different girl. Her name was Angel. And she was a prostitute. And I saw her when she was young. I saw her raped. I saw her molested. I saw the spirits involved. I saw the people in her family. I wrote down four or five pages worth of stuff on my yellow tablet about some girl's name Stephanie had never met. On a Wednesday night, a few weeks later, Stephanie shows up at church. I knew who she was when I saw her. And Stephanie got saved that night. But you talk about a young girl that was um, messed up. She was messed up. And so... Her forgiving was like a six-month process. She had so many people to forgive, so much stuff to deal with, okay? So Stephanie started living with one of our families. We got her off the street. We got her out of all that crazy stuff. And uh, one night, it came time to really deal with the demons behind all this whole thing. So I'm sitting in my chair. I got two or three other people there because I know it's going to get pretty intense. And before I can even get started, she starts ripping off her clothes. She became angel sitting there. Talk different. Dress different, acted different, everything. And she's looking at me. Her countenance changed everything about her. She became another person. Looked at me and said, uh, I know you. And slapped me so hard, knocked me out of my chair. I hadn't even bound the spirit yet. 
last time I did that one. And it took four men, one sitting on each leg, one on each arm, to hold her down while these demons came out. She started foaming at the mouth and went all the way down to her navel. And Stephanie really got set free that night. Now we did a year and a half worth of ministry before we got to that point, okay? Today, Stephanie is married. She lives in Nashville. She has six kids. There have been books written about her. She's been on television shows. She's been on talk shows all over the nation. That God's power is greater. Because I had a dream. And I listened. So I get, I get cards from Stephanie. <laughs> That's just so. Another girl, because we lived by Disney World, we had 50 guys and girls coming out of gay lifestyles in our church. We had really gay services. And uh, that was funny. <laughs> and there was a girl, she said her name was Billy, and she's coming out of a gay lifestyle. And Billy went through a lot, and Billy forgave one day. I looked at her and said, your name's not Billy. What is your name? You know. And so she shared her name, and I introduced her to the church with her real name. You know? And anyway, she had been so abused in her life. And uh, she did so good. She really got saved. She got set free. And she moved away, and I hadn't seen her in a couple of years. And I invested two years in her, you know. So one Sunday morning, I'm getting ready to preach. She came walking through the back door on the arm of her husband on her honeymoon. Mm. Totally free. Been married for 15 years now, has children. Mm. People matter to God. And without the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we can't help people. That's why when I started off by telling you I earnestly desired spiritual gifts because I, I, without them, I can't help people. I, I got to be able to discern. I got to be able to cast out demons. I mean, I got to have faith. I, so I could tell you stories all, all day. I mean, literally all day about these kinds of situations and people. And so deliverance is just a part of what we do. I don't make a big deal out of it. I really don't. Did I miss any guys? Service pretty much similar to the whole servant area that we talked about. So now what are you going to do with your gifts now that you've discovered what they are? The scripture says you're supposed to employ them. From my perspective, most of the church is unemployed. Most of the church, they go to church. They're great people. They love God. They worship. They help support their local church. They might go to small groups. But most of them come to church for them. You have to have a change of mind. You're not coming to church to get. You're coming to church to give. Now, do I always get when I come to church? Yeah, worship. I get ministered to. I get taught. I can get prayed for. Okay? But there has to come a point in time when you start doing the work of the ministry. So I told them last night, it was a Saturday night in Orlando, and our church is just a little bit north of Orlando. It's like a suburb of the city, and the name of the town is called Apopka. It's an Indian word for, it means big potato. <laughs> our church had a lot of appeal. <laughs> so, so anyway, it's a Saturday night. I'm all ready for Sunday. I got a message. I'm ready to go. I spend all day Saturday not writing messages. I already have all that done, but praying through messages and really getting in the presence of God. 
So anyway, that night I had a dream. I saw the Lord looking at our worship service, and the Lord went, I'm so bored. I'm like, excuse me? What do you mean you're bored? So this is going on in the dream. And I said, well, what would you do? And the Lord literally said to me in the dream, since it's my church, I'm glad you asked. Oh. <laughs> yes, sir. And I, I, I had a vision of the four corners of the auditorium. In one corner, there was a sign that said physical healing. Another corner, there was a sign that said prophetic ministry. Another corner had a side that said um, uh, spiritual warfare. And I don't remember what the last one was. So anyway, there were four signs. Oh, fresh and filling of the Holy Spirit. So I got up that morning and made myself four signs, put them up in the auditorium, told the worship team, you're going to be playing a long time today. <laughs> I stood up, told the people about the dream that I had. I picked people out of the audience that I knew could do those different things. I sent them to the corners. I said, here's what we're going to do the rest of the day. It's what was in the dream. We're going to continue in worship and you in the audience. You can go to any corner you want for prayer. You can go to all four corners. But you can't leave until you join the team and pray for somebody. Church got out at four. People wouldn't leave. And people got on their phones and started calling their friends and their family members. Hey, people are getting healed down here. We started the service with maybe 250. We ended with 400. And it's because the body was doing the work of the ministry, not the pastor or his wife. His job is to equip you not to do all the work. You don't pay him enough to do all the work, trust me. And so you know what we do every now and then? I tell the church, hey, we're doing a four-corner service. And you'd be shocked how many people show up for church. And it is fun. I mean, I, I didn't go to a single corner. I just walked around and made sure people did what they needed to do and go to the different corners and sat down and talked to visitors, led some people to the Lord, sit down in the audience. You know? <laughs> but it, they wouldn't go home. When's the last time people wouldn't skip lunch and stay for church? It says in Acts 2 that there was a, a sense of awe in the church. Mm -hmm. That's what we got to get back to. Amen. Well, when we come, we're coming to give. God's given us a word. We're going to pray for somebody that's sick. We're going to encourage somebody. We're going to serve. We're going to, we come to give, not to get. And as you give, you'll get. Am I talking to the church? Did you hear what I'm saying? Okay. So now I, I do this all, I do, I do four corner services all the time in different places. And it's just amazing. And people get excited when God uses them. So I can tell you all stories all day and you'll enjoy them. And they'll build your faith because that's why we share testimonies, right? But until you see God use you to bring a person out of the wheelchair, or to send a demon, you know. If you deal with somebody in the masons, you know what you do with the spirits? Put them in a mason jar and put a lid on it. <laughs> True story. I got a call to go to Throckmorton, Texas, West Texas, tumbleweeds, all ranches. The pastor said, Brother Joe, there's a spirit here. I've never been there. I said, what do you mean there's a spirit there? He said, we've had a drought for three years. The town is literally drying up and blowing away. The ranches are closing. People are leaving. He said, and I'm telling you, he said, there's, it's a spirit. So I'm like, why me? You know. So I, I fly to Dallas and get a car and drive to Throckmorton, Texas. He said, be careful where you park your car. There's rattlesnakes everywhere. I don't like snakes. You know the worst kind of snake? A sneaky snake. <laughs> so, so I'm in Throckmorton, and I'm driving around. And I'm just trying to discern, okay? And um, I drove the only nice building still standing in town was the Masonic Hall. The Lord spoke to me and said, all the men in this church, including the pastor, are masons in that building. They have been for generations. And I've cursed the ground with a curse. 
Now, I don't know if you really understand Masons, but in the main halls in different counties, you go in the basement, there's a pentagram in the basement. You've heard the phrase hoodwinked. They put a mask on the father. He stands on the point of each pentagram, repeating phrases and language he doesn't understand, dedicating himself and his children's children to the worship of Satan. The Masonic stuff is as serious as it gets. If you look at a dollar bill, their symbols are on it. It's one of the biggest principalities in North America, and it's all over the world. So I called the pastor and all the leaders church to a meeting on a Saturday night. Told them what I saw and what the Lord said. And they're all staring at me like, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a Mason. Well, I just happen to have a six-page, <laughs> I always go prepare, <laughs> teaching on the Messiah. And when I got done, it was 1 o'clock in the morning, and those men repented. They all had all Masonic rings, the jewelry, all of it. So the next day is church. I did the same thing with the church. Somewhere around 1 or 2 o'clock, the church stood up repented, and they took off all the Masonic garbage. And um, I pronounced forgiveness over the church, and I'm telling you, when I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I pronounce forgiveness and the blessing of God, and the curse off the land is broken. Thunder shook the building, and the drought was broken. So these strongholds that are out there are real. Spiritual warfare is real. The kingdom of darkness is real. And our nation's literally being taken over. Do you know what the word Hamas means? It's in the Bible. It means terror. It literally means terror. All these college students want to be a part of Hamas? Are you kidding? It's a stronghold and it's demonic and it's terror. I was in Jerusalem. I mean, I was in Israel and I was right next to the Gaza Strip and they were putting grenades on balloons when the wind would blow toward us and grenades would just drop anywhere in the city. I was in the city of Ashdod. They'd shoot rockets and just hit a house. Kill me. I mean, it's terror. It's like living in terror every day of your life when you go over there, and it is principalities. I mean, it's demonic as it can possibly be. And our colleges are celebrating it. How sick is this nation going to get? Are we going to just sit by? Or are we ever going to rise up? Now, you know what? Your area, your area has a good spirit over it. It does. This area is going to be more and more fruitful. There are good things going on here. I see the blessing of God over this area. I see people really genuinely coming. They're moving from all kinds of different places and different backgrounds. God's going to bring people into your church. So you're in a good place. This place, the spirit over this place is so much safer than other places I go. If I go south of here and go to New Orleans and the voodoo, okay, okay, uh, just to give you an illustration of how serious the, the Masonic stuff was, there was a pastor in Voorhees, New Jersey, and uh, his name is Dion. Anyway, I knew them for years, and their daughter turned 18, great girl, godly girl, and she went crazy. I don't mean she started the struggle. I mean, she went crazy. And so I was in the area one time, and Dion said, Pastor, would you come over to our house? We don't know what to do. We think our daughter's going to kill herself. This has been going on for like eight months. So I go over to their house and, you know, I ask them to leave so I can just be alone. I just want to listen to the Lord and pray through the house. I went up in the daughter's room and there's a giant mirror on the wall with like somebody hand carved the wood all the way around the mirror. They were all Masonic symbols. So I bring them back to the house. I said, uh, when did she get that? When she turned 18. Who gave it to her? Her grandfather made it for her. We took that mirror out of the house. We burnt that frame. It wouldn't burn with gasoline. I had to get a torch. And we burnt that frame and got rid of that stuff, and her mind came back to her. And today she's, she works in the medical field, and she's brilliant. But she lost her mind. There's a book written called Ridding Your House of Spiritual Darkness. And I'm telling you, boys and girls, we're living in days that you have to cleanse your house. 
You have to cleanse your house. You cannot have Harry Potter stuff hanging around. Who is he? He's a wizard. Where does he get his power? There's only two sources of power, you guys. There were prophecies in the 90s that said in the last days that the homes of people's homes would be invaded by the demonic and that the demonic would come into the houses through screens. What do teenagers do most, most of their lives? What are they looking at? Have you ever looked at the, some of the games that they play? Why is it all the, all the things look like demons? Cleanse your homes. Okay? This stuff is real. A pastor on our network, his name is Rick. He's in Pittsburgh. Rick was a tennis player, 40, 42 years old. Great health, great athlete. Went home one day, played three sets of tennis, took a shower, getting ready to go to the office, got out of the bathtub and couldn't walk. Couldn't walk. Ambulance came, took him to the hospital. They're mystified. They did several back surgeries. He'd never had a back problem in his life. He had to relearn to walk. I'm in Florida. Rick's a very good friend of mine. And I'm telling you, when I heard the news, everything in my spirit reacted. The Lord literally said to me, go to Pittsburgh now. I went to Pittsburgh. I took a guy named Paul who'd come out of the occult. And uh, we got there and Paul began to search the dark web for that area. And a witch's coven had moved into a house two blocks from the church. And that ram's head was on the porch, the whole thing. And we found their website and their vision as a website, their purpose statement was to destroy churches, kill pastors. Hmm. The pastor of this church before Rick died and nobody ever understood why he died. They were mystified that he died. He's only in his 50s. So I'm like, why in the world? So then we went to the church building. The Lord kept telling me there's something to building, something to building. It's an old school building they remodeled. I went down the basement. There's an old furnace room they don't use anymore. It's locked up because it has asbestos in it. I went in that room and there was a statue of Molech in that room. So we got rid of that, destroyed it. Went and visited the witches. <laughs> Oh, I really enjoy doing that stuff. <laughs> and um, uh, Rick's totally restored and he's doing fine. But you talk about wake up a church, it woke up a church. When churches are involved in spiritual warfare and people are leaving churches and there's dissension and all this crazy stuff goes on, who do you think's behind it? Mm -hmm. Ephesians says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. People are not the enemy. Say it with me. People are not the enemy. The enemy's the enemy. Now, does the enemy use people? Do people get stupid spirits? We all do. But people aren't the enemy. But there's a real enemy that hates this church. That's why we need intercessors. That's why we need prophetic people. That's why we need people who have gifts of intercession. Gifts of discernment of spirits, right? Because we're in spiritual warfare, okay? Warfare for me is the way of life, okay? I was in the Caribbean with uh, Bishop Heligar and the other black pastors, and we were on St. Lucia, and there's a volcano there. And I'd never been there before, and it's not the part of the Caribbean that you want to go to as a tourist. It's the inner part of the island where the poor people live. And, and that night, something showed up in my hotel room, and it looked like a really, really grisly old man and he, it was a demon. He called himself the god of the volcano. And he says to me in this very guttural voice, Man of God, what are you doing on my island? You have no authority on my island. Well, you know, it's 99 degrees. There's no air conditioning. And I wasn't in the mood. <laughs> so, I jumped out of bed. Anyway, he left. And um, so the next day, I'm mad. The demon said to me, no one's been saved on that island in 30 years. Hmm. I own this island. So now the question is, why does that 
demonic strong have, have authority over this island. What's that about? So I found the pastor. I started researching. Here's what happened. There were two churches on the island, two brothers. Used to be one church. The two brothers had a big fight and split the church. Now there's two churches, and they don't speak to each other. So I grabbed that pastor and Bishop Pelagar. We went and found the other brother. Hi, we're not leaving until we deal with this. And it was so stupid what they were mad about. So after hours, I got their wives in the room, <laughs> got their adult children in the room, and we brought repentance, and they got right with each other. Well, that night we had a worship service in the main square of the village, and the worship bands who used to play together came back together as one band. Incredible worship. And um, preached the gospel. And the brothers repented before the whole island of what they'd done. The two churches became one. Mm -hmm. So they preached the gospel, and like 36 people got saved. And I'm looking up at the volcano, and I'm like, Timber, yeah! Right. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff is real, you guys. So I don't go around looking for demons everywhere. I want to know what right they have to be there and what authority they have. And so I like investigating. I want to know where did that thing come from? How did it get there? Right? Okay. Now, I'm good at deliverance because I got delivered. Hard to believe, isn't it? Looking at me, you would never think, right? When I was in high school and college, I had a spirit of rage. I don't mean I had anger. I had rage. From my youth, I had a father who never came to a single event, ever. I loved Little League. I was playing Little League one day, riding my bicycle home. Dairy Queen across the street, all the dads take their kids there after the game. I'm sitting across the street thinking, what's wrong with me that my dad never goes? So something on the inside of me, rejection, abandonment, all that stuff, right? And that got stronger in me and stronger in me and stronger in me. When I got into high school, I was on a wrestling team and wrestled in high school and college. We won a state championship. And I didn't win because I was a better wrestler. I hurt people. I loved breaking noses. That was my specialty. If you break a guy's nose, he quits. I broke fingers, broke a guy's wrist. I had a, I had a demonic strength that I can't describe to you. One day I got off the bus and my best friend, I was like a junior in high school, my best friend sitting there and he said, hey, I was dating a girl named Debbie. He said, I'm dating Debbie now. And without thinking, I grabbed him by the belt buckle. He's a big guy, he's a football player. Grabbed him by his collar, picked him up in the air, body pressed him, slammed him down on the curb, almost broke his back and he couldn't walk for six weeks. So when I got saved, I genuinely got saved, but I still had this Rage because I hadn't forgiven my dad. And so one day I picked up Angela, my little three-year-old. She made me, so, I threw her across the room. She bounced on her bed and hit the wall. And something in me broke. I desperately needed help. I'd go to my pastor and they'd pray for me, but they didn't do deliverance. So one day Karen and I go to Daytona. Some, somebody's watching the three kids. We have a weekend at the beach. And it got rainy and got whole cold at Daytona, which it never does. Karen's like, well, let's go to the mall. I don't go to malls. Are you kidding me? So she went to the mall. I stayed in the room. And the Holy Spirit said, literally, I want you to, I, you need to spend some time praying. So I'm kneeling next to a bed in a hotel room. I'm looking at the wall. And God is playing a video of my life. And up to that point, I'm in my early 30s. I'd never cried in my life, not once. Because men don't cry. So this video is playing of my life and all the stuff that happened to me in my youth. And I'm telling you, it's like God poked his hand in my heart in a torrent of hurt and bitterness and anger came out of me like a river of this stuff. And I really forgave and I really got, I mean, I got delivered and I got set free. And I'm telling you, my personality changed. I became soft. I used to be really loud. I used to be combative. I put the high school, high school quarterback in the hospital one time. I didn't like quarterbacks. And I had a supernatural, demonic strength. 
So I know what it is to need deliverance. But if somebody had done deliverance for me and all the healing hadn't taken place, it would come right back. Right? So that's why I have the book. That's why my book is based on, because I had this scheme of abandonment in my life that had to get dealt with. And thank God he dealt with it. I've been free for 40 years. <laughs> so I like being free. Does anger ever try to come back? Sometimes on the interstate, if you cut me off, I'm going to put you in the wall. But other than that, other than that, you know, <laughs> I can get angry, but I don't have rage. I'm very free of all of that stuff. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's pray together. Father, I pray that as they consider the giftings and they consider the gifts that you've given them because you said you gave all of us gifts. Lord, I pray that you would begin to stir in the heart of your people a desire to minister to other people. Lord, to get words of knowledge, to have prophetic dreams, Lord, to flow in the Holy Spirit. Lord, there are desperate people out there like I used to be that desperately need help. And Lord, we're the ones that are supposed to be doing the work of the ministry. And Lord, I pray that if we've been selfish and we just come to church to get, to not give, that you would change our hearts. And that, Lord, we would become ministers within our own households, within our own families. Lord, that our grandparents and uncles and aunts and nephews and nieces, God, that they wouldn't go to hell. Lord, you said when somebody got saved, it always says, and their household. So Lord, let us start at home and let us start within our own church. But Lord, help us to see that people matter to God. People matter to God. And Lord, that's the only reason that we can do the things we do. Out of a heart of compassion, with the grace of God on our lives, Lord, nothing can happen unless the Spirit of God does it. So, Lord, I know if you can take a farm kid and do something with them, you can certainly do something with these. So, Father, I pray that the life of this church would change. Lord, I pray that people would show up with an expect expectation that they're going to pray for somebody, they're going to care for somebody, they're going to love somebody, they're going to talk to somebody, they're going to encourage somebody, they're going to invite somebody. Lord, they're going to share the gospel. Lord, if they don't know how to share the gospel, they're going to learn how to share the gospel. But Lord, may we be equipped with the anointing of God to break the yokes off of the lives of the people in this area. Lord, you're blessing this area. Your favor's on this area. Lord, let this church come out of hiding where it would not be hidden anymore and let it come to the forefront ablaze with the glory of God, the power of God. Lord, with all the gifts functioning. Now, guys, just one more thing. Just I feel like the Lord is saying this church is like a diamond. And diamonds are multifaceted. And that the Lord's going to keep shining this diamond up. And this diamond is going to reflect the glory of God. But each part of that diamond, each face of that diamond is going to be polished. It's going to be glorious. And it'll be seen. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for giving me your Saturday. Tomorrow we're going to do an interesting thing. <laughs> tomorrow we're going to experiment. <laughs> so what we're doing tomorrow is um, there's going to be some deliverance tomorrow. So, yes, the pastor's going to get delivered. <laughs> Um, what I'm doing tomorrow is I'm doing a message on how God speaks and how you can have a spiritual mind. Mm -hmm. I have found 17 different kinds of minds in the Bible. Anxious mind, fearful minds, worry mind, I mean minds, and unbelieving minds, evil minds. And we're going to look at the, what is the spirit of your mind and how you can get the spirit of your mind to be right so that you can hear from God. Make sense? 
So that's why we're doing it tomorrow morning. 